My name is Joanna Doronovo. I'm a senior um, investigator and conciliator at the Australian Human Rights Commission. I also happen to be the union delegate <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> um, so, um, so today we've been asked to come in and I guess give you a bit of a sense of federal discrimination law. Um, so can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Um, and the with a bit of a sort of focus on sexual harassment, um, I will kind of cover everything just so that you have a good sense because probably a lot of other stuff will be relevant to your work. Um, happy to keep a pretty easy flow. There's not many of us. We've got plenty of time. So if you've got questions as we go, or there's anything you want me to go over in more or less detail, uh, just yell out, that's totally fine. Um, so, have people had much to do with the Human Rights Commission before? No. No. Yeah? Okay. So, what we'll do today is have a little bit of a, an overview of the work of the Commission and then talk about um, talk about uh, broadly kind of what the law covers and then talk about the specific pieces of legislation that we deal with and then finally go over the complaint process. So, so the Commission is, um, well, been a lot in the media, probably not so much now, thank God, but um, <laughs> last year. <laughs> we have a number of functions, um, which is why sometimes it can get a little bit confusing when you hear different things about the work of the Commission, is that we're actually kind of split up into different parts. So we've got our Commissioners, um, who are statutory appointments, um, and are appointed to, I guess, advocate and promote human rights um, in their particular jurisdiction. So we've got, at the moment, seven statutory appointments, which given we're like 120 workers, <laughs> is a lot of statutory appointments. Um, so we've got an age discrimination commissioner, disability discrimination, children's rights commissioner, um, Human Rights Commissioner, Race Discrimination Commissioner, Sex Discrimination Commissioner, um, and then we've got um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. Um, don't think I've forgotten any of them. And then we've got our President. So our President actually has kind of the statutory functions around complaints and so on, um, which is why Gillian Triggs was so much in the news a couple of years back. Um, so we have our policy area, which I guess does kind of projects and um, also promotion work. So they're quite, you know, government submissions, those sorts of things. And then um, we have our complaint handling function. We have a legal team, which sometimes goes in and um, obviously does the legal work of the commission, but also goes in as amicus of the court in certain cases, but we don't actually prosecute matters on behalf of parties. Um, so the bit that I'm in is the Investigation and Conciliation Service. Um, and I guess it would be a bit like the organisers in a union. So we're the ones kind of on the ground, um, you know, doing the grunt kind of day-to-day -day work. Um, so we handle, um, there's about 20 odd of us. Um, and we handle all the complaints and inquiries that come in about discrimination. So we get about 17,000 inquiries a year um, and about 2,000 of those will turn into complaints. Um, so, so that's kind of the structure of the Commission. So thinking about um, federal federal discrimination law and what it covers, we actually administer five different pieces of legislation, which makes things <laughs> interesting for us and our parties. Um, so we have the Australian Human Rights Commission Act, 
the Racial Discrimination, Sex Discrimination, Disability and Age Discrimination Acts. Now, they were all diff different. They're all written at different times. They all have different histories. Um, and so that can make it quite difficult for people who are not familiar with the jurisdiction, which let's face it is most people, um, to navigate. Um, so what you'll get is things like, for example, the Sex Discrimination Act came straight out of um, the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination and Violence Against Women. Mm. Um, so initially, men weren't covered at all. Um, and it's kind of been through amendments that, that men have increasingly become covered by the Act and it's kind of now been expanded to include things like um, gender identity, sexual orientation, anything to do with sex is in there. <laughs> um, sex or gender is, is pretty much covered. Um, and then you have something like um, the Disability Discrimination Act and when the Disability Discrimination Act was written there was no international convention on the rights of people with disabilities. So that's kind of um, got a very different history. And because the Disability and Age Discrimination Acts are a lot more recent, they're kind of easier to read um, and a bit more straightforward. But they all have their little quirks, um, which is why I would always encourage people, like if you're considering lodging a complaint, I mean, by all means, look at the legislation, but if you've got questions, just give us a call because <laughs> we don't expect you to be, you know, experts on the law. Now, of course, as you probably know, each state and territory then has its own um, anti-discrimination agency and piece of legislation. So in New South Wales, that would be the Anti-Discrimination Board and the Anti-Discrimination Act. Um, what the states have done, which, you know, is quite clever, is they've shoved everything into one piece of legislation rather than having different pieces of legislation like we do in the Commonwealth. There have been attempts to consolidate it all, but as you can imagine, trying to get politicians to get anything done can be a little bit <laughs> tricky. <laughs> so, looking at some of the general concepts in the law, So the main focus of the legislation is to cover discrimination on the grounds of a particular attribute in areas of public life. So quite important to note that they don't cover private relationships, except in some circumstances, um, which not all of them do. So I remember, for example, we had a delegation from South Korea and their legislation actually covers family. Um, so, you know, if you're a family where, for example, the parents um, gave the son an opportunity to go to university but not the daughter, the daughter can lodge a sex discrimination complaint. Um, I would hate to be trying to resolve that one. Um, <laughs> but so in the case of, of Australia, you're looking at areas of public life, which of course includes employment and goods and services. Um, which is and and also um, trade unions, so um, representative organisations. Okay, so have people heard about direct and indirect discrimination? Yes. Yep. Yeah. What is what do you think the difference is? What does it kind of say to you, or what's your sense of what it is? So direct discrimination is a little bit more conscious, whereas yeah. indirect discrimination might be a result of. Uh, a structure or a, uh, yep. a rule that kind of results in discrimination rather than... Yeah, absolutely right. So direct discrimination is essentially where there's um, a deliberate um, intent. Well, there's, the court actually doesn't require there to be intent, but where there's less favourable treatment because of a particular attribute. So you have to be able to have what they call a comparator, which means that, say if you're looking at disability, that you're being treated differently than somebody <coughs> without your disability because of your disability. So your typical kind of examples will be, you know, I told my employer I was pregnant and then all of a sudden there were performance issues. Yeah, so there's kind of this very clear link where you consider that the reason something is happening to you 
is because of a particular attribute that you have. Yeah. Um, now, in direct discrimination, as you were saying, it's kind of a broader thing. So it's meant to kind of capture the fact that sometimes rules that appear to apply to everybody equally actually disadvantage particular groups. So there's a requirement or condition which appears to apply to everybody but which disadvantages somebody because of a particular attribute or disadvantages people with that attribute um, and is not reasonable under the circumstances. Now, in most of the acts, it's up to the respondent to show that a requirement is reasonable. So not up to the complainant to show that it isn't. So the kinds of things that might fall into that are things like um, that you can't get a promotion if you're a part-time worker, for example. Why do you think that might be a problem? Care and responsibility. Yeah, care and responsibility is kind of the major one. The other one that comes up quite a bit at the moment are things like rotating rosters, um, which uh, can happen a lot in news agencies, for example, but also um, other organisations now that we're in a 24-hour sort of cycle. Um, and if you've got a disability that requires you to have regular sleeping and eating patterns and potentially medication patterns, it's very difficult for you to, to conform to that. Um, so that's the kind of situation. I mean, the most obvious one that we always talk about is if you've got steps to a building. It's not that you're deliberately trying to keep Mr X who uses a wheelchair out, but the effect is that Mr X can't get into the building. Any questions about that so far? Okay, have people heard of vicarious liability? Yeah. yeah. So what vicarious liability says is that if you are, you can be held liable for the actions of your staff. Um, and it's actually quite broad, so it's defined differently in the different acts, but it can either be the actions of your staff, your directors, they sort of all have different phrasings, but some talk about servants, agents, etc. So basically anybody who it is in your control to manage the behaviour or conduct of, if you have not taken reasonable steps to prevent um, discrimination or unlawful acts, then you can be held liable as well. Where do you think this might come up a lot? Probably the main one where we get vicarious arguments is um, sexual harassment. Mm. So, you know, Bob Smith, your manager, sexually harasses you, you can lodge a complaint against Bob Smith and the company if you don't think the company has taken sufficient steps to prevent sexual harassment. Um, and the kinds of things that a court looks at when it's talking about reasonable steps, and again, the different acts phrase this differently, but in the Sex Discrimination Act, it is all reasonable steps. Um, so not some steps or whatever. It actually says all reasonable steps. Um, the kinds of things a court might look at might be things, obviously, how big the organisation is. So the steps are going to be different for a small business than they are an international corporate. Um, but it's not just about your policies and procedures. It's about, well, how often are those reviewed? What's actually in those policies and procedures? Um, is there training? How do complaints of sexual harassment generally get dealt with? Um, because if you've got a culture where you get punished if you complain, then potentially you haven't done enough to prevent sexual harassment. Um, there was a recentish case, which has kind of become a bit of a landmark case, which was um, Richardson versus Oracle. So Oracle's a very large um, corporate. She alleged what was relatively low level sexual harassment, I mean as in it was primarily comments and propositions, um, and the court actually found that 
the company had taken quite significant steps to to try and prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. What they ultimately got kind of pinged on was the fact that, for example, they did not cite the actual sections of the law under which sexual harassment was. So they said it was unlawful, but they didn't say under which laws and what sections were relevant. They also didn't say that um, the employer could be held vicariously liable. That's what they went down on. Yeah, so pretty high bar um, that the court has set. So um, there's also sort of other forms of liability in the Act. So accessory liability. You think of if you've watched any American crime shows <laughs> when somebody's an accessory to murder because they helped to bury the body or whatever. Um, so accessory liability is basically the concept that if you aid, permit, instruct, direct someone to commit an unlawful act, then you too are responsible for that act or can be held liable for that act. Now we actually tend to get that more um, probably in disability discrimination um, because what you'll get is, you know, someone goes to their corner shop, um, they use a wheelchair, there's a couple of steps, they lodge a complaint against the corner shop, the corner shop says, well actually I rent the premises, I don't have control over um, putting in a ramp. Um, the person who does have control is the owner, so all of a sudden the owner can be added as a respondent to the complaint. The owner might say, well, I've just done a full refurb and I did a development application to council and council didn't say anything. So if council has permitted that to happen, then council can be held liable. <laughs> um, so you kind of can get these kind of sort of building block type complaints where you end up with five or six respondents all on aids and permits. Um, so for example, I recently had a case of somebody who was sexually assaulted in the context of a work for the doll placement. So through aids, permits and vicarious liability, we've basically got, so there's the guy, there's the company, the guy was running, so unfortunately it was the head boss. Then you've got the employment service that placed her there, you've got the employment service that actually vetted the placement, um, and ultimately sort of it goes up the ladder. Yeah, so, um, so it can be pretty wide ranging how much of a net you wanna cast, yeah. You know? um, Victimisation, anybody got a clue what that might be? Yeah, exactly. And the wording, again, is pretty broad. So it's any less favourable treatment uh, towards someone, and this you can name individuals, so it can be um, just a particular person. Um, so it can be, if obviously, if you've made a complaint, if you've indicated an intention to make a complaint, or even if you've asserted your rights or someone else's rights under the Act. So I recently had a matter where a branch manager in a large corporate had assisted a number of women in his section to lodge sexual harassment complaints against another manager. Um, and then he alleges that he was treated less favourably because of that. Um, and so he lodged a victimisation complaint. Yeah, but he wasn't asserting his own rights, he was asserting other people's. Um, but because he considered that he was targeted because of that, um, he could lodge a victimisation complaint. Any questions about any of that? Okay. So the Australian Human Rights Commission Act, which is probably the chunkiest one, um, because it actually sets up the Commission. So that's the Act that has all the bits that say that we're able to investigate complaints, what we're able to do with those complaints and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it also has two particular jurisdictions and this gets a bit weird but essentially it has two jurisdictions where it allows the Commission to investigate and conciliate complaints and to ultimately make determinations about those complaints. 
But unfortunately, there's then no enforceable remedy to that. Um, so the first jurisdiction is human rights. And that's basically where um, it's alleged that the Commonwealth or one of its agents, so it's important that it has to be the Commonwealth or an agent, has contravened somebody's human rights under a particular convention. And, and they, you know, there's a list of kind of the conventions that are covered, which are the ones there. So things like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, um, and so forth, including actually the ILO Convention on um, Elimination of Discrimination in um, Employment or Occupation. The other jurisdiction which uh, could be quite relevant to you is what we call our ILO jurisdiction, and that's our ability to investigate complaints alleging discrimination in employment or occupation. The main sort of grounds that we use in that jurisdiction, and, and that jurisdiction basically says that it's discriminatory to treat someone less favourably, so to make any distinction, exclusion or preference because of particular attributes, and that includes trade union activity, importantly, and it also includes criminal record, which very often isn't covered anywhere else, so we're kind of it, um, and religious belief. Um, it also has a whole bunch of other grounds like disability and age, um, sexual orientation, which we used to use before we had acts to cover those. Um, so, and that's, we also use this jurisdiction if we're talking, for example, about things that are work but don't qualify as employment, because in most, in our legislation and in most of the state ones, work is defined as paid work. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about volunteers or work experience placements, they're often not really covered. Um, and so sometimes we'll look at matters under the ILO provisions because that's employment or occupation, so it's a bit broader. Um, and so we can kind of say, so you know, if somebody's, for example, on um, a placement or a volunteer placement, which of course a lot of artists would do a lot of work for free because they need to gain that experience, if they are then discriminated against in that placement, they can access the ILO provisions, even if they can't access, say, the Sex Discrimination Act provisions. There are a couple of exceptions built into the law. One is inherent requirements. So guess what? If you're a pedophile, it's OK that we don't let you work with children, mm. um, even if, you, if that's discrimination on the basis of criminal record. And um, the other one is religious um, organisations. Now, a lot, I mean, there's a lot of talk at the moment about religious organisations exemptions. The threshold's actually pretty high. It's not as if you just go, oh, I work for a religious organisation, I'll find then. Um, you have to actually demonstrate that not discriminating against that person would be offensive to the tenets of the people who hold that religion. So that's, for example, the defence that very often Catholic institutions use around sexual orientation of staff or marital status of staff um, because they will claim that that you know homosexuality is offensive to the tenets of Catholicism for example not just mm. Catholics but um, but it's up to it is ultimately up to a um, it's ultimately up to a respondent to make out a defense so we've got what's called a shifting burden of proof we got lawyers in the room no. So burden of proof is about who has to prove what, yeah? So um, in a complaint, a complainant has the onus of showing that they've been discriminated against, but then the respondent has the onus of demonstrating if any defence applies, yeah? So it kind of shifts from one to the other. So as you might imagine, under the human rights jurisdiction, probably the majority of complaints we get are about immigration detention. Um, so things like arbitrary detention, interference with family, um, cruel and inhumane treatment, um, those sorts of things. In the ILO jurisdiction, probably the most we would get is actually criminal record. Um, 
it's a pretty blatant area of discrimination. Like employers are quite happy to tell you that they're not employing you because of your criminal record. Um, but we do also get trade union activity ones. So, um, and the typical situation would be things like not getting promoted because you're seen as a troublemaker or something like that. Um, now in those cases, if we, now usually we try and conciliate matters. So we try and help parties resolve it. If we think that discrimination has occurred and we can't resolve the matter, then the president may decide to report on the issue. And that report has to be tabled in parliament. Yeah, so um, it becomes a public document. We can make recommendations, but we can't actually enforce it. Um, if you are interested, um, on our website, if you go to our legal section, um, there's a section on reports under the Australian Human Rights Commission Act, and, and they're all listed there and you can read them all. So, and I think there are a couple about trade union activity. Can I just ask a question <coughs> yeah. about the agents of the Commonwealth? How, how Sorry? What's the agents of the Commonwealth? Like what's a, what, how far so, is the agent? So, yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm open to argument on that one. Um, so, for example, in the case of immigration detention, the Commission, there are some that are pretty easy because obviously, for example, the Commonwealth hires um, international health and medical services to provide medical services in immigration detention. So it's a pretty clear connection where IHMS is an agent of the Commonwealth. So there have been reports that have mentioned IHMS or the various incarnations of Group 4 security, which is now broad spectrum, um, and Transfield and all of those. Um, with some of the others get a little bit more complicated. So we did have a report that we did on the rights of the child, which was about the fact that um, non-residents are required to pay to access Australian primary schools. Um, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child says that all children have the right to free primary school education. Um, so in that case, we actually found that the <coughs> New South Wales Department of Education was an agent of the Commonwealth because they receive funds from the Commonwealth to deliver education. Mm. Um, but it's not, just because there's funding doesn't mean that the state is an agent of the Commonwealth. So you have to kind of show that the Commonwealth actually has control over how that is delivered. So it's, it's kind of a bit of a difficult argument to make, but it, was there one that you sort of had yeah, in so mind? We've got, because uh, many, uh, cultural institutions are funded through the Australia Council. Yes, uh, that would absolutely be it. Well, that is the Commonwealth, because they're a Commonwealth they're agency, the, aren't they? The, the recipients of the funding would then come in as ah, agents. Yeah, yeah. They could, theoretically, there'd be an argument to be made, um, because I know, for example, universities are sometimes considered agents of the Commonwealth, so, because they're fully funded by the, well, not fully, but, you know. The funding body is the Commonwealth. Right. Yeah. So yes, it, it could be arguable. Yeah. Um. Okay. Any questions about the ARCA before I move on to racial discrimination? Okay. So the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, which is the oldest of the four sort of unlawful discrimination acts. Really difficult act to navigate because it's quite different from all the other ones. So the discrimination provisions are, are very broad. So they basically say that it's unlawful to treat someone less favourably um, by impairing or nullifying their human rights, un any human right under any convention. <laughs> um, but also in particular areas of life that are listed in the Act. So when we look, for example, at employment, we look at employment, but we also look at employment under the International Convention on Elimination of um, Racial Discrimination, which is where the Act kind of springs from. Um, it's the only Act that actually makes it um, possible for a complainant to allege that a law is racially discriminatory, um, whereas the other Acts don't. Um, 
and and of course it has that distinctive feature of racial hatred which has been so controversial in the last couple of years so again i mean the public areas of life are pretty consistent across all the acts so the, the main ones would be employment goods and services education which are kind of your obvious ones but you do have things like membership of clubs and associations um, trade unions um, qualifying bodies um, accommodation sport in some of them um, so it's quite it's reasonably broad um, and we're reasonably creative um, <laughs> about how we interpret particular acts um, so racial hatred that old chestnut um, so racial hatred, I guess, has three sort of um, tenets or three sort of parts to it. So it has to be in public. Uh, the act says otherwise than in private, which just means public. Um, it can be any act. So it doesn't have to be speech. It can be an artwork, for example. Um, it has to be obviously that the person feels offended, humiliated, intimidated. Offended is the word that's caused so much controversy because, um, as you know, our former Attorney General says, um, you don't have a right not to be offended. Um, the, but then it also has this what's called like a reasonable test or, or an objective test, which is that a reasonable person of that ethnic or racial group would be offended under the same circumstances. So it can't just be because you personally are offended. There's kind of an objective test as to whether, for example, other indigenous people would find a comment offensive or other Chinese people or whatever. Um, there is a defence, importantly for you guys. So there is a defence which is that it's not unlawful if it is done reasonably, very important word, and in good faith, very important expression, um, in the context of a whole range of activities which includes artistic work, which includes public debate, um, which includes political commentary. So the Alan Bolt, Alan Bolt? Andrew Thank you, Andrew Bolt. Um, the Andrew <coughs> Bolt case which kind of started the ball rolling on sort of the um, attempted various attempts at getting rid of 18C. What the issue was, so as you may recall, if you remember back that far, um, Mr. Bolt wrote an article essentially raising questions about um, the entitlement of some Indigenous people to benefits when, in his view, they were essentially white people. So they were physically quite light-skinned and in some cases were reasonably well-off people. Um, now, he, there was a complaint of racial hatred which went to court and was successful. Now, the reason it was successful was because the court found not that it wasn't done in the context of public debate, but it questioned the reasonableness and the good faith aspect. Yeah, so essentially what the court was critical of was the manner in which Andrew Bolt decided to express his concerns, given that he's obviously a very articulate person with a good platform. You have other cases, for example, where you have, say, a recent matter, a recent-ish matter, where it was a news website um, and people had put a whole bunch of comments and the site... So the person uh, was an indigenous woman who'd lost, um, I think, three of her children in a car accident. There was an article about it, and the children had stolen a car. So a number of boys had stolen a car. There was a car chase. Four boys died, three of whom were her children. Um, there was an article about it, and then, of course, there were comments, as there often are. And many of those comments um, the, the woman found quite offensive towards herself and Indigenous people. The matter went to court and the court found that the website was vicariously liable for the comments. 
so that vicarious liability that we talked about before because of the way it monitored the comments so that it didn't kind of have any kind of um, it wasn't pulling out comments that were potentially offensive um, so there was a conscious decision to do that um, the however what the court then looked at was the nature of the comments and some were were sort of found to be racial hatred others not and the ones that weren't was because the court was satisfied that although they were very unfortunately sort of phrased and and could be deemed offensive it was because the person had limited wasn't very articulate rather than because the person was deliberately trying to be offensive. Obviously you can dispute that, but <laughs> that's what the court found in that particular matter. So it's by no means kind of a straightforward, if you say something offensive, you're gonna get dragged to the court. You know, like it, it's quite a, it's quite a strong protection of speech um, because the, you know, there's a belief that speech is important, um, <laughs> but there is a, you know, there is that sort of reasonableness and good faith part in there. In terms of the example, so probably the majority of cases, probably about half the racial discrimination claims we would get would be employment related. We only get a really tiny number of um, <coughs> racial hatred complaints and a lot of those are actually associated with employment. So it might be a boss that makes really offensive comments towards a person um, in front of other staff or over radios or things like that um, or things like comments in toilets um, you know uh, graffiti in toilets and things like that um, it's pretty rare that we would get like a high profile you know newsreader or newspaper article or whatever or a cartoon um, they've kind of gone up since all the hubbub, but even then we only sort of got like 70 in a year. So it's not like they're a massive proportion of our complaints. Um, most of them are just straight out um, employment matters where people consider that they either weren't hired or didn't get promoted because of their race. Um, and then we get a lot of goods and services. So um, people who are dark skinned not being allowed into clubs. Um, people of certain skin colours or ethnic groups being followed around shops or having their bags checked more than other people. You know, it's more that kind of complaint. Any questions about the Racial Discrimination Act before I move on to sex discrimination? Um, I have a quick question about sort of the, the causal link between the discrimination that's occurred and the, uh, I suppose the head of discrimination. Mm. Like it's about proving not only that someone has been denied something, yeah. usually, but but it's because, because of the because yeah. of part. Like, yeah. um, how how much like you know evidence does the commission need to be satisfied that because you know no yeah. employer really is going to be stupid enough no most of the time to be able to say yeah we definitely did this because of yeah yeah it's pretty rare. Yeah. <laughs> Um, they are sometimes stupid enough to do it or to send each other emails and then accidentally include the complainant like oh we don't want another yeah. Arab in the office that sort of thing um, <laughs> but but that's pretty rare um, <coughs> there's actually a really good article um, that I'm about to reread um, that Jonathan Hunya who was our head of legal for a long time wrote and it's on Osley for those of you who access Osley and I think it's called Skin Deep um, and it's um, and Hanya is H-U-N-Y-O-R and it talks it's pretty old but it talks exactly about how difficult it can be to establish racial discrimination because often it is a gut feeling mm -hmm. like the person just gets a sense that their race is a factor but it's often very difficult to establish um, there are cases where it's easier than others for our purposes our thresholds pretty low so as long as the case is so again they're sort of different what's called standards of proof which different sort of institutions use so the criminal standard of proof anybody know that beyond one doubt. beyond a reasonable doubt so you have to establish to the court beyond a reasonable doubt that something happened um, the standard of proof for discrimination is the same as that for civil matters 
which is that on the balance of probabilities, something happened or is discrimination. And there's what they call the Briggenshaw test, which is that the more serious the allegation, the more evidence you kind of have to provide, yeah? Um, for our purposes, it just has to be arguable, which is a bit lower. So if what the person says appears could be demonstrated, would it be discrimination? Now, sometimes there's overwhelming evidence to say that their race had nothing to do with it. Um, other times it's a little bit murkier. Um, so yeah, racial discrimination is one of those areas where there's often a lot of discussion within the commission about do we think there's enough evidence here, et cetera, et cetera. And is that standard arguable? Is that set out in the legislation or is that sort of borne out in the case? Or? Well, essentially it kind of comes, and this is kind of getting a bit technical, but essentially it comes from the president's power to terminate complaints for certain reasons. So because obviously, because in the case of race, disability, age and sex discrimination, we <coughs> don't make decisions, the court does. So our main purpose is to provide parties with an opportunity to try and resolve the matter through conciliation. So the president has a number of um, uh, grounds on which she can decide to terminate a complaint. Now that's an administrative decision, not a judicial one. Um, so one of the grounds is where she's satisfied that the complaint is lacking in substance or misconceived. So it's almost like the burden's on us to be satisfied that it's lacking in substance. Yeah, so we have to really be of the view that there's just absolutely no evidence of discrimination or that the, the um, complaint is misconceived so that the person misunderstood the facts or the law so it doesn't clearly kind of fit within the law or that um, one of the other grounds is that the discrimination was not unlawful. So that's usually when an exemption or exception applies. So racial hatred, for example. Um, so let's say we get a complaint of racial hatred. The first thing we look at is, could the comments actually be considered racial hatred? Um, and we have actually a reasonable amount of guidance on that because the courts actually considered the issue quite deeply. Um, so, for example, just saying um, you're a slob doesn't, if it's said to an Indigenous person, say, um, isn't necessarily racial hatred if you don't tie it to the person's race, like you abo slob, right? So, so it can get quite technical in that sense. Um, the um, so that would be a substance call. So if we really think that the that the decision, like that the comments couldn't possibly be considered racial hatred, that would be a lacking in substance decision. If, however, it gets over that threshold, but for example, the artist provides clear information as to why it was an act of artistic expression and that has a reason for being etc then potentially we would say they've met the exemption and therefore it's not unlawful does that kind of make sense but even if we terminate a matter the person can still go to court so and have the matter heard there so because it's an administrative decision not a judicial one so we can say, look, we're not going to spend any more time on this, <laughs> but the person then still has the ability to take the matter to court. The difference now is that if it gets terminated for that kind of reason, the person has to seek leave from the court to proceed. Yeah. Whereas if we just terminate it because it couldn't be resolved, the person can go straight through. Uh, I didn't catch the name of the author of the article. Sorry, it was Jonathan Hunya, H-U-N-Y-O-R. And it's skin deep and it's something like inferences and evidence of racial discrimination in employment. Thank you. And we found it so And it is on Osley and it's 2003. <laughs> I only know because I was looking it up yesterday, so... 
Um, okay, any other questions about racial discrimination? Just to how I'm doing on time. Oh, fine. Okay. Sorry, so can I ask you um, which yeah. ones get conciliated with um, Harry Ock and which ones um, where a decision can be made in the Commission? So, okay, so we can conciliate any matter. Yeah. So if any complaint, um, if in any complaint it appears appropriate to conciliate, we try conciliation and if the parties reach agreement, that's conciliated. So we can conciliate any matter in any jurisdiction. Um, in cases where the person has alleged a breach of human rights or that discrimination in employment ground, which was kind of your criminal activity, trade union activity one, if the matter can't be conciliated, we then have to make a decision one way or the other. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, the person doesn't then have access to the court, okay. um, which is why on human rights, some people go straight to the UN. They can actually do that. Mm. Um, so the Human Rights Law Centre, for example, has taken a number of matters to the UN. Um, and sometimes they've gone through us first and other times they haven't. Um, with um, race, sex, disability and age discrimination, again, we can try and conciliate the matter. If it doesn't conciliate, the person can then go to court. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Phone's gone to sleep. Okay, so the SDA, um, so this one sprung straight out of CEDAW originally, but has been amended on numerous, numerous occasions. <laughs> so it now covers, as you can see, quite a lot of grounds. I do have SDA up there, don't I? Yeah. Sorry, I can't actually read them. So if I've got the wrong one up, please tell me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so the Sex Discrimination Act covers sex, which isn't defined anymore um, because it's considered non-binary. So we're not quite sure what the courts are going to make out of that one. Um, it covers gender identity, intersex status, sexual orientation, family um, responsibilities, um, marital or relationship status, uh, pregnancy, breastfeeding, <laughs> and pregnancy includes potential pregnancy. Mm. Um, and then of course it's got the sort of the sexual harassment aspect. Now the, the um, grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity and intersex status only got added in 2013, so they're relatively new law buys. Um, some of the states have now followed suit and have them as well. Um, so sexual orientation, probably reasonably obvious, um, although some people have tried to stretch the definition. It is about people over 18, um, sorry, with the ability to consent, adults, sorry. Um, and it's about same sex or different sex attraction. Um, polygamy. Or, or polyamory are not considered sexual orientations. <laughs> we have had people try. Um, and what the various courts and tribunals have said is that that's about how many people you have a relationship with, not what um, sex they are. Um, and also pedophilia, not a sexual orientation because one of the people would be um, unable to consent under the law. Um, gender identity, um, so what, it's a bit broad and again it hasn't been tested in court so we don't quite know how the court is going to interpret gender identity. It is meant to be about how the person identifies themselves to the world. So. Unlike some of the state legislation, so for example, um, Anti-Discrimination Act has transgender status um, as a protected ground, um, but transgender status actually, I believe, still requires medical intervention. Um, in the federal law, there's no relationship to 
any biological or medical features. It's purely about how the person identifies themselves and presents to the world. Yeah. Um, we are starting to get a lot more complaints now under gender identity, so it'll be interesting to see if one of them actually goes to court. At the moment, we're settling them all, so... Nobody wants to be the, um, <laughs> the trailblazer on that one, I don't think. Um, so, sorry, so you could ostensibly under that because it's quite broad. Yeah. If you were um, a man who identified, who had was male-bodied but presented quite femininely mm. and, and you were discriminated against on those grounds, even mm -hmm. though you identify as your, um, you were assigned male at birth and identify as male but present in mm -hmm. a way that society identifies as being quite feminine, that yep. would be covered by that because yes. it's broadness. That's excellent. It would appear to be covered, yes. yes. <laughs> I'll say appear because <laughs> <laughs> <who knows? laughs> it would appear to be covered. At the moment, we are accepting complaints <laughs> by <laughs> people in that situation. Also because, I mean, as some of you may know, like if you are actually considering a transition, you're actually required to live socially as that as the sex that you are wanting to transition to so there is a period in which you would essentially have to start identifying in a particular way without necessarily having physical or other features that identify you as that so um, one of the complaints I had recently was someone in exactly that situation so they didn't have um, a diagnosis um, it was someone in the armed forces um, it was they hadn't been to a doctor yet they had just come to that view and so all this person did was start wearing the female uniform so she was complying with the female uniform procedures but of course she got whacked for um, not following guidelines about how men and women should dress um, and essentially the problem was that at that time the policies required for you to kind of go into the category of a trans person um, you had to have a diagnosis of um, gender dysphoria and have you know already be monitored by various specialists before and she hadn't started that process yet so um, so it was quite an interesting matter we managed to resolve it and she stayed a serving member so that was really good um, intersex status again is a bit tricky so essentially the definition is someone who may have um, reproductive organs that are male and or female or neither um, it's not intended to be a third sex so the guidelines are very clear about that it's not about ma man woman intersex um, intersex is separate so the idea is for example that you could be an intersex person whose gender identity is male female or non-defined um, so X or different people have different names for how they refer to themselves gender fluid etc etc so having one status doesn't eliminate other status but again, we, we don't quite know how all this is going to interact um, once the matter is actually taken to court. So sexual harassment. Um, again, three components. So it has to be conduct that is of a sexual nature. Again, quite a broad definition. Um, so again because sometimes it can kind of be in the eye of the beholder so to speak um, it has to be unwelcome and again there's sort of this objective test which is that a reasonable person having regard to all the circumstances would anticipate that the person could be offended humiliated intimidated etc so it covers a lot of conduct so, and some of the conduct that it covers is quite wide ranging. Um, I think there's often this assumption that sexual harassment is just about somebody trying to molest you or trying to get onto you. Um, it's actually quite broad. So it can be things like comments, jokes um, of a sexual nature. 
it can be things like materials in the workplace so that sort of concept of a sexualized workplace for example so if you are a person in a workplace where everybody's telling each other you know who they had sex with on the weekend and going into details and you find that intimidating offensive etc you can lodge a sexual harassment complaint even if that behavior wasn't directed directly at you yeah um and then obviously it goes up the different types of conduct like exposure of um, sexual organs um, and obviously intercourse now i don't use the word rape because rape is a criminal term um, so the way that the court would consider sexual intercourse in the context of sexual harassment is obviously unwelcome sexual intercourse and there have been you know a number of cases of that you aren't required to demonstrate sexual harassment in the context of sexual intercourse, you don't have to demonstrate you were raped. Again, because that um, standard of proof is lower um, and because you're not trying to make out a criminal charge. Yeah, so um, you don't have to have gone to the police. You don't have to have had the level of evidence that you would in, um, in a rape trial. Yeah, so there are situations where we do get complainants who have, who are also pursuing a police matter, um, in which case very often we'll hold off until the police investigation has completed so that we're not accidentally tainting evidence or anything like that. Um, and then the person can pursue a sexual harassment claim. Yeah. Um, any questions about that? What's the definition of sexual nature? Is that quite broad? Of sexual nature. What kind of thing? Ah, uh, there isn't one. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those you know it when you see it type thing. Ultimately, the court would make a decision in each particular case. Um, I there have been situations <laughs> where we have terminated matters <coughs> because we haven't considered the conduct conduct of a sexual nature. But again, it can often depend in the context. So we had, for example, a complainant who complained that she was attending like adult education and that a colleague was eating cheesels or burger rings, I can't remember now, by sticking them on their fingers and then sucking them off. And she was saying that that was sexual harassment. Now, there was no other conduct involved, so it wasn't coming in the context of somebody who's making a lot of suggestive comments and then coming up to you and going, Mwah, you know. Um, it was in isolation. There was no real other contact alleged. Yeah. So, you know, we were kind of saying, look, I think that's a little, <laughs> you know, it's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> um, I think one of the other ones where we might have questioned was someone who actually ended up taking a lot of matters to court and eventually being declared vexatious by the court, um, including, I think she even alleged Jonathan Hunya in one of her matters, sexually harassed her by um, nibbling on a pencil mm. while he was taking notes. Um, she also asked a judge to recuse himself on that basis, which he didn't take very kindly to. Um, <laughs> so there are situations, but it's pretty we wouldn't usually make that call because i mean really the majority of cases we get it pretty clear mm -hmm. like it's not um it's not something that's argued usually where you tend to get disagreement between the parties is either that it didn't happen at all or that it wasn't unwelcome mm -hmm. so we do get situations where perhaps and look and in some cases there was a consensual relationship at so, so you might have acts that were consensual and acts that weren't. Um, difficult thing about relationships in the workplace, I guess, you know, is that you might go to a certain level and then one of you kind of goes an off or I'm not comfortable with this anymore and the other person keeps pushing, all of a sudden you're on sexual harassment territory, yeah? Um, or you might have people who go along with it because they don't want to lose their job. You know, so that's quite, and there's precedent around that. So the court has said that just because somebody goes along with particular conduct for an amount of time doesn't mean that it wasn't unwelcome. Mm -hmm. So just because the person doesn't raise objections immediately, 
Um, and sometimes what we tend to see are people who are lodging after the fact, so after they've left an organisation or when something else has gone horribly wrong, then they bring up sexual harassment kind of going back a period of time. Yeah. Can I just ask, just in terms of understanding, uh, just in the slide before, about how you identify what is sexual harassment, is mm. the part about the reasonable... Um, like mm -hmm. so the reasonable person test. That's basically essentially what kind of society is in consensus about. So um, if in the example, like if in my, so an example is like what is of a sexual nature, maybe in five years we'll talk about burger rings differently or whatever. Well, very possibly, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Because for example, comments about appearance Mm. Um, these days are quite common in sexual harassment claims, yeah. um, whereas potentially 20 years ago you wouldn't have had a chance trying to do that. Um, so, you know, if you've got somebody... And I think the tricky thing about sexual harassment, um, and probably many of you in the room would kind of have a similar experience, is it's kind of like you know it when it happens. You get that icky skin crawly need to have a shower feeling which if you just kind of went he said this or she said this mm. it would be difficult to communicate why that's a problem it, it's mm. often kind of coming in a broader context and when you look at some of the cases particularly where there's relatively low-end sexual harassment what you see is the um applicant creating a picture of how that fits into a broader context of conduct mm -hmm. um whereas you know the more serious conduct is pretty self-evident you know if you're photocopying and somebody comes up behind you and starts moving their groin against your bottom then that's kind of pretty straightforward mm -hmm. you know unless you're in a consensual relationship and even then it's potentially problematic mm -hmm. <laughs> so um but a lot of the kind of offenders do like to live in that gray area where they can make those sly comments that are hard to pick absolutely up on. absolutely and look and sexual harassment is a really difficult um, area I mean it might not surprise you to know that probably the overwhelming majority of our complainants around sexual harassment are women but certainly not all mm -hmm. um, and probably most of the individual respondents would be men but again not all um, and you kind of, I mean, we see everything from he kept asking me out on dates and just wouldn't quit um, to sexual assault, essentially, like um, unwelcome um, sexual intercourse where, where someone has either, I mean, there's quite um, a well-known case uh couple of years ago maybe and now of course I can't I think it was Vergara was the respondent I can't remember was it Alexander there's a couple that I always get confused but where you know she was actually his boss sort of like she was sort of his supervisor and and there was a whole range of conduct kind of building up from him offering to give her shoulder rubs um him following her to the station, trying to engage her in conversation. She's kind of continuously knocking him back. She then alleges that at a social function, he, she alleges that he put something in her drink. Um, the court didn't make a finding around that. And that they ended up going back into the work, into the office. She woke up the next one, so she doesn't remember much of this wakes up the next morning feeling like she's had sex, goes and gets tested, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, and has accused him. She hasn't gone to the police, so she has an alleged rape, um, but she accused him of unwelcome sexual intercourse, and the court found that, in fact... I mean, it, the court basically said, look, we don't care if she was just drunk or... Um, <laughs> drunk or um, drugged. Um, she clearly had no capacity to consent and her previous behaviour towards you would leave you no reason to think as to why she would consent. Mm. Um, so, you know, so there was a lot of discussion. Now, the other thing with that one, the point that it brings up is that whole thing of what does it mean to be in the workplace? Mm. Um, obviously, most of our complaints are about work. Um, so in the Sex Discrimination Act, it would probably be like 80% of our complaints are employment related. 
and within the employment it would kind of be pretty evenly distributed between general sex, pregnancy and sexual harassment. Um, and in the context of work can include places outside work. So the kinds of things that a court look at are things like, would you be there but for your work relationship? So, you know, a lot of organisations that are starting to move their Christmas parties off site, because um, we do tend to get a bit of a surge in January. Um, you know, you're not necessarily getting yourself off the hook. So if you've got, for example, a very civilised function on site and then everybody goes to the pub afterwards and gets completely blotto, then you're still potentially in that work nexus okay. and the company can still potentially be held liable. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there have been a, a number of cases that have kind of set up that, that precedent. Um, but, you know, but there is, again, there's an argument to be made. So as soon as you're kind of off the reservation, you, you, um, there's arguments that turn on the facts of the particular case. So, I mean, there was quite a well-known case, which was Lee versus Smith and the Defence Force, which was about a woman who was um, a civilian employee on a base, like a town that had a base on it. Um, and she, again, alleges that her drink was spiked. She was actually at somebody's house, not... Um, not in the workplace. He had, however, engaged in a number of acts that would appear to constitute sexual harassment, including exposing his penis during a training course and things like that. Um, she then goes to a social gathering which he is at. She alleges she essentially blacked out after a drink, so she thinks her drink was spiked, and woke up with him having sex with her. Um, she was successful in that case because the court basically said she was on a base town. She wouldn't be there, but for the fact that she was working, the people whose house she was at were colleagues from work. Um, there's no way that would have happened other than for their working relationship. So it found that to be in the context of employment. Um, Defence went down really hard on that one because she then reported it. He got legal advice, she didn't. Um, they did move her to a different team so she didn't have to work with him but he was on um, century duty on the base so she had to go past him every day yeah. um, and the court was pretty unimpressed yeah. with that response um, so she actually got one of the highest awards of damages in a sexual harassment matter I think she got something like 600,000 um, and a lot of that was because of the department's response to, to her complaint um, because it obviously aggravated the emotional distress. So, I mean, her, you know, she was in a relationship, the relationship broke down, she developed depression, she had post-traumatic stress disorder, the whole range of sort of issues. Was there also an expectation that Defence would have um, relevant systems and policies and procedures that deal with matters like this in a... Yeah, you know, in a broad context, they're not a small organisation. No, no, so absolutely, and, and I mean, and they're dealing with people in remote locations where these things are much more likely to Is that happen because people are kind of in this cooped up kind of okay. greenhouse bubble type environment. So, um, was yeah, that one no, of the reasons that led to such a? Sorry, um, was that one of the uh, things that were considered with the? Oh award? God, it's been a while since I read it. Um, Thank you. But, yeah, I believe so. I think they looked at a whole range of... But, I mean, really, Defence just had nowhere to go on that one. They just... It was just such a bad... They just dealt with it so badly overall that, um, you know, and this was all kind of... This was actually all before the sort of Academy scandals and okay. stuff. So <laughs> they, they're doing some pretty good stuff now um, with us. Like, it's a pretty... On, it's an ongoing project around culture change, but, you know. Can I just ask what you find the defence from employers can be if the victim hasn't reported and they've come to you? Um, well, doesn't matter. She's got every right to come to us and not yeah. go to them. Um, particularly if she's got no faith that anything will actually happen yeah. or if they don't have grievance processes or... Yeah. Um, so no, not really a defence. And because in vicarious liability, what the court is looking at is um, what measures were in place to prevent 
the sexual harassment. So overall policies are obviously relevant. So yeah. if there's lots of cases where women have come, or you know, employees have come forward alleged sexual harassment, and nothing's happened, or even worse, they've been punished, that kind of creates a particular culture. So the court would be looking at that. Mm -hmm. But strictly speaking, the court isn't looking at how your own complaint was dealt with, mm -hmm. except perhaps in considering the issue of damages. Because obviously, if you go to your um, employer and complain and nothing happens, then potentially there's, they're kind of aggravating mm. the injury. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, which is why we get victimisation attached to a lot of sexual harassment matters, they actually then get pushed out of the business, particularly yeah. in corporates. So, yeah. So, I mean, coming for, for our context, I'm mm. thinking of our industry is developing this huge, big, vigorous policy platform and we'll be rolling out and yeah. best endeavouring to stamp everything out. Mm. We're still going to... Good luck with that. <laughs> even though they've got great policies, we'll still continue to potentially come up against people who have experienced yeah. sexual harassment that still don't want to report. Mm. Mm. And I'm just curious as well. They don't if they they don't have to report it. It's not they're not required to, to report it. Make a claim. Yeah. Okay. They're yeah. absolutely not required to I mean obviously the employer will know once we're yeah, looking sure. into it. But um but you know, if they're for if you're talking for example about somebody who's working in a fixed contract like on a show or something yeah. or a play and something happens so a technician goes on tour does does a yeah a production something, something happens, happens. It drinks afterwards yeah the tour's got three weeks left they, they might three quite weeks. happily sit those three weeks out and then lodge a complaint yeah. yeah yeah absolutely um so there's no um it's not held against a victim that yeah. that she or he chose not to lodge a complaint at that particular time okay. um, and that's because there's an understanding that victimization is pretty mm. swift in in a lot of cases and but also just that it's uncomfortable you know the person might prefer to complete their contract mm. and they or you know in some cases if you're talking about permanent employment they'll look for other work and then they'll lodge the complaint yeah. once they've got other work. Gotcha. Okay. You know, so, and that's totally fine. Yeah, that's not a problem. Is there, uh, I remember when I was dealing with the South Australian legis legislation, isn't there a, lim is there a limitation of one year, 12 months on? on there is, claims? I'll cover that okay. in, in a second, yep. Okay, so there are, um, so your areas are kind of pretty mm -hmm. the usual. Um, your exemptions, probably the one that would maybe come up for you would be the inherent requirements. So, you know, you can have, because we do get complaints about this, you know, I'm a man, but I want to play a woman's part. It might be open to sort of the employer to say, no, that part was, <laughs> is intended to be a woman. Um, <laughs> and can't on this occasion be played by a man um, but you know again because it's a defense up to the respondent to to set that up yeah so not a taken for granted but um, but it is there can I ask a question about pregnancy yeah discrimination? Um, so we have a lot of journalists that you know have babies and mm. um, quite often they're made redundant <laughs> we know they get made redundant <laughs> oh, do you yes they get made redundant while they're pregnant yes. on maternity leave. That's quite a common. So when I say like about a third of our employment matters would be pregnancy discrimination, right. that's often what it looks like. Okay. So it's pretty rare now that you'll get the straight out, you're sacked kind of, mm. or made up performance issues. So how um, much proof do you need like to make a complaint? Like you don't know whether it's the case, but if um, you're on maternity leave, Look, there's usually there's usually a pretty clear kind of pattern because very often it's a redundancy of one. Right. Um, so you know you'll often get an employer trying to say, "Oh no, it was totally operational requirements," blah blah blah, mm -hmm. and then you get like, "Okay, but the only person made redundant was this person," and then you advertise the exact same position two weeks later. Right. That kind of tells us that there's a 
that's the same thing when they <laughs> come back. connection. When they return to work and then they get made redundant as well, That's if they're the only um, one. Yeah, look, I mean, there'd certainly be potentially a link. And I mean, I suspect in that case, you'd probably also add family responsibilities because it's usually... So we sort of get the... You get the... Okay, I told him I was pregnant and then all of a sudden, like my performance started getting picked apart and da da da. Mm. Then you get, I mean, sometimes you get blunter than that, particularly in small businesses, but that probably wouldn't be so much an issue for you. But the, I'm pregnant, oh well, we can't have a pregnant woman on the floor, mm. see you later. Um, <laughs> but you know, if you've kind of gone beyond that, um, then it will be the picking performance, then it will be the, um, no, you can't take mat leave because you're not a permanent employee or mm. you mm. haven't been here for a year. Um, again, we're not the Fair Work Act. We don't care what yeah. people's entitlements under that are. Um, if you require time to pop a baby out, um, then if you're not given that time, then that could be a requirement or condition that disadvantages women. Yeah, so because, or pregnant people, because you need some time off to get the baby out of you. Um, so there should be, I mean, whether that's paid or unpaid, that's a bit different, yeah. but um, but your employer should give you some time out to have your child if you are pregnant. Um, then we get the whole stuff happening while people are on mat leave or then when they're trying to return. So no, you have to return full time. No, you can't work from home, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, okay, great. yeah. thank you. So the whole range. So look, really, I mean, what I tend to say to audiences is don't overthink it. If it stinks, like, just lodge it. Um, I mean, obviously, taking into account what that's going to do to the employment relationship, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, um, a lot of these things don't have a paper trail to them, so it's it's not, um, you know, but the courts know that as well. Like it's, again, it's that balance of probabilities test. Is, is it more likely than not that the pregnancy was a factor? And that's the important thing. With all these attributes, it only has to be a factor. It doesn't have to be the dominant factor. It doesn't have to be the only factor. It only has to be a reason, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions about FCA before we move on to DDA? Um, so, you're saying that like, yeah, you just tell people to file, uh, but then they have to think about what the effect on the employment relationship is going to be. Mm. If we tell someone to uh, make a complaint, mm. is, there, is there an investigation process during which the employer doesn't know about that, or is there... They would always, th we have to notify them. Straight away. Uh, not immediately, no, but I'll come to that when I talk about the complaint process so we can cover it then. Um, okay, so DDA. So disability defined pretty broadly. I mean, I've got a whole list there, but that's not kind of how the Act defines them. So the, the Act looks more at things like, um, you know, total or partial disfigurement, uh, malfunction of a part of the body, presence in the body of an organism capable of causing disease. You know, it's kind of quite broad. Where would you, would you consider under this um, that mental health problem? Absolutely. It's a, and did, it, does it fit under a particular one of them? Uh, all of them. <laughs> Anything, I think the way the Act talks about it is any, any, oh, how do they define it? I think it's any condition which causes the person to learn or interpret the world differently. Like it's got quite a broad, so basically all of them, depression, anxiety, um, and um, importantly, um, it can be past, present, future, or imputed. Um, so imputed just means when somebody thinks you have a disability. Um, so for example, we get this a lot with mental health where somebody says, oh yes, I have had depression before, or I have anxiety, but it's managed. And 
they kind of don't get the job or because it often comes up at pre-employment medicals that's usually where it gets picked up um, or then you have employers that have screening tools where they ask you have you ever received treatment for a mental health condition and you might have somebody who did like five years ago because their partner of 30 years died mm -hmm. um, and they're fine now thank you very much but they still get knocked out can they even ask that question mm. like yeah, employer. can they even do that? No, employer. They can. So what the Disability Discrimination Act says is that it can, well, it's arguable. So they can ask a question if it's for the purposes of accommodating your disability or assessing whether you can perform the inherent requirements of the role. If they are asking you to discriminate against you, then no, they can't. Mm. Well, how do we know why they're asking? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, you look at all the circumstances. So, you know, and often it's about how they ask it. So, for example, we see some forms where they say, do you have a disability? That's probably not cool. Um, you have others where they say, do you have a disability that could make it difficult for you to do the job? That's probably more okay. As long as then they ask you, what could we do to make sure that you can do the job with that disability? Yeah? What about alcoholism or other types of drug dependence, are they considered Sorry, uh, alcoholism or drug dependence, is that a disability? Okay, so um, addiction can be a disability. It doesn't mean that it's okay for you to shoot up at work, um, but for example if you're on a methadone program and you need to duck out to go and get your dose, um, so you need a break to do that or if you're asking not to, for example, drink on stage because you're an alcoholic and you're trying to recover or if you get sacked because somebody sees track marks on your arm from when you used to be an addict, um, then that's all covered. Yeah. So you have to be in recovery, some form of recovery. Uh, look, it, it's a tricky one, not necessarily, because for example, there was a case in the court where a woman was requesting a transfer in a, so she was in a national corporate, so where they had um, offices in various cities, and she was requesting um, a transfer from Melbourne to Perth because she had a gambling addiction, and yeah. she said that obviously in Perth it's much harder to gamble because there's no pokies. Yeah. Um, and she did lose the claim, but only because the employer was able to demonstrate that working in Melbourne was an inherent part of the job. Um, so it wasn't an adjustment to move her, but the court didn't question that she had a disability. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then at the same time anyway, like illegal drugs, like that's criminal. So yeah, like if you're engaging in unlawful activity, that's yeah, probably cool. not, <laughs> probably your employer will be able to argue yeah. It's an inherent requirement of the job that you're not engaged in unlawful activity. Yeah. But for example, if you have a situation in a small company, I don't know if this happens or not, but where, you know, people in the company might have to, um, you know, waitress as part of their job. If you're an alcoholic and you say, I can't be around alcohol mm. because I am a current alcoholic, because obviously, depending on your views on alcoholism, you might be recovering, but you remain an alcoholic, um, then that could be an adjustment that you say, I can't do bar duty, I can't be around alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, so. But the employer could argue where it's an inherent part of the job. Like they could, the but that's their argument to that's make. Their argument to make. Yeah. yeah. That's their argument to make. Um, now, the thing also to remember is that um, it covers associates. So where this comes up a lot is, for example, people looking after an ill parent or sibling or child um, that can kind of come under DDA. It can also come up for women who have complications in their pregnancy. So it can kind of overlap between pregnancy and disability discrimination. Um, so associates could be things like you need to finish at 3.30 because you need to pick up your adult child with a disability from their day program or whatever. Um, 
it does include assistance animals, um, aids, all of that sort of stuff. So it's pretty broad kind of coverage. Um, there is disability harassment, to be honest. I don't think I've ever seen um, a court case on disability harassment. So usually, but even if it doesn't meet the threshold of harassment, it could be disability discrimination. So if you've got a manager that's constantly making comments or humiliating you because of your disability, then you can probably argue disability discrimination. You don't need to go up to the disability harassment threshold, um, but it is there. Um, that's just the areas which are kind of your use. Um, so your employment, education, probably in terms of complaints, probably about half to 60% would be employment matters in DDA. And it kind of ranges from all the stages. So recruitment, didn't get the job because I have a disability to, um, cause they found out I had a back injury 20 years ago or whatever, um, to kind of current, like I, got injured on the job or I developed a mental health condition or I always had a mental health condition and it spiked and there's problems to kind of I got sacked because of a disability. Um, then we'd probably get about, I don't know, 20% goods and services and then we'd get the rest kind of, we get quite a few education, so kids in schools needing adjustments, that sort of stuff. Can I just ask about the last point, the administration of Commonwealth laws? What, what does yes. That, what does that sort of... Uh, so things like if... So, for example, that case I was telling you about where the woman was sexually assaulted in the context of a Work for the Doll program, that's administration of a Commonwealth law program. She wasn't an employee. Um, she was, you know, a member of a Commonwealth program, and so that's kind of... So things like... Commonwealth initiatives or administrations of a particular law, so the way a particular law is implemented could be disability discrimination, depending on how that's done. So for example, if, um, let's say, Centrelink in making you apply for the blind pension requires you to fill out printed forms and you can't read the printed forms, um, you can make a complaint that that's discrimination in the context of both receiving a service and Centrelink administering a particular program. So you can't question the program itself, but you can question the way it's administered. That kind of yeah. makes sense. Um, there's also disability standards. Now this is probably kind of getting a bit more detailed than you need, but. Um, you can make standards under the Disability Discrimination Act which just essentially extend the meaning of it and at the moment we've got transport premises and education um, and contravening a standard means that you're contravening the Act. Now a very important concept in the Disability Discrimination Act is that of reasonable adjustment. So that's basically the idea that if you have a disability that you disclose your employer has an obligation to make reasonable adjustments to accommodate that disability. Um, and any adjustment is reasonable unless it imposes an unjustifiable hardship. So that can include things like, so obviously mine is pretty straightforward, like I'm legally blind. I obviously have to read a lot of material as part of my job. Um, so reasonable adjustment might be things like, I have technology that helps me do that. They make sure, for example, that I don't get handwritten complaints because I find those too hard to read, you know, things like that. So, but it can range, it can be really broad. And recent case law has actually upped the ante on those. So you can have everything from different duties, different reporting lines, different working hours, sometimes different locations of work, um, different methods of work, um, all sorts of things. Yeah, so very, very broad concept. Um, there are exemptions and exceptions in the DDA. Probably um, the most commonly used are the unjustifiable hardship and inherent requirements defence. So inherent requirements is basically anything that if you changed it, the job wouldn't be the job. Yeah, so if like sure, I can get adjustments to 
enable me to read the files, but I still have to read the files. I can't say I can't have any files because my whole job is about mm. handling files. So, um, so things like that. And it can be pretty broad. So it can include things like being able to do your job safely, not presenting a risk to yourself or others, etc. Um, but for example, the kind of thing that we might look at is sometimes a job will say, oh, a driver's license is an inherent requirement. And it's like, well, depending on what you're doing, like, are you actually driving things around? Or is it that you have to get independently from A to B? Because if it's that you have to get independently from A to B, that's the inherent requirement, not the driver's license. Yeah? Unjustifiable hardship is the main sort of defence and it's a defence all across the Act and basically what it says is that it's not discriminatory if you're having, if it would impose an unjustifiable hardship on you not to discriminate against the person. So again the bar is set pretty high um, because you're talking about unjustifiable, it can't just be inconvenient or really expensive. Um, you have to actually say that it wouldn't justify doing what you need to do not to discriminate against that person. So there are actually very few cases where that defence has been made out. So, so there's no way of uh, getting any sort of declaratory relief on in, in terms of the unjustifiable hardship? Like, so if an employer thinks that it might be an unjustifiable hardship to get some kind of guidance Mm, you'd have to go to case law, really. Um, there isn't kind of a sort of ticker box list, like a checklist or something like that. And, and there's no kind of body that says these are the kinds of things that would impose unjustifiable hardship. Because the problem is that what a person... I mean, the thing about disability discrimination is you can have two people doing exactly the same job um, and sometimes with the same diagnosis, who have it completely different needs because it will all sit around how they manage their disability. So you could have someone, so for example, I still use large print. I use a cane to get around. Um, I use voice, um, etc. You could have somebody with exactly the same level of vision as me who because of maybe they've had that vision all their life or because they just got exposed to different services than I did, do use a guide dog, have everything electronic, you know, so you, you can have, so a lot of the cases in disability discrimination very much turn on the facts of the particular case because <coughs> what you're going to need to do to accommodate a person as an employer is going to be completely different from one person to the next. I mean, you can have two people with depression who have completely different triggers for their depression or different adjustments that they require to accommodate their depression. So there's kind of no one size fits all um, response to that one. It's very much a case by case basis thing. So if you're an employer, it kind of sucks. <laughs> it's very difficult for you. Um, but, you know, so pretty typical sort of cases would be sort of those situations of like, I need an adjustment. You know, I've recently had one where it was a young journalist who unfortunately had a chronic condition and needed to take a lot of time off because she was just learning to manage it and she got sacked um, because she was deemed unreliable, um, which was really unfortunate. And then obviously just kind of ongoing needs for adjustment. Um, now I'm going to fly through age discrimination, but any questions about disability before I move on? Okay, um, so age discrimination, fairly straightforward, covers age. Um, <laughs> it also covers group age groups, so, um, and, and very often with these acts they talk about um, they talk about characteristics associated with a particular group. So it's pretty rare that someone will say, we're not hiring you because you're too old. They'll say, oh, you're overqualified or you don't fit the culture of the organisation or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the Again, the majority of age discrimination cases are employment matters. Um, 
the areas are kind of pretty familiar ones. Um, the defences, <laughs> youth wages. <laughs> you are absolutely allowed to exploit our youth. Mm. Um, however, where we tend to get complaints are when these kids turn 18 and then 21 and their wages start going up and all of a sudden they get less hours. <laughs> um, so that can be age discrimination. Yeah. Can I just, um, on the previous slide, it said age does not extend to imputed age. What, mm. what do you, you if someone thinks you're a particular age rather than the age you actually are. So if you look old for your age or young for your age um, and you get discriminated against for that reason. Yeah, it's kind of a bit obscure. I don't think we get that many. But sometimes you do because it might be someone looks too young for like we get this sometimes with real estate agents for some weird reason, like young women don't get hired. And some of them might be in their 30s, but they look really young. Mm. And they'll say, oh, you just don't look trustworthy or you don't look like you know what you're doing. You know, mm. you don't look confident enough. It's that sort of, that sort of thing. Yeah. We have sort of, this, sorry, just, I just want to unpack it a little bit more because this is a big issue for actors. Big yeah, big. yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, so we sort of have the opposite issue where often audition forms will ask for an actor's age. Mm. And um, a lot of actors, uh, you know, myself included when I was performing, hate putting that down, particularly if you don't read the age you are. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, the argument has often been made, well, you know, the character is between, you know, uh, 40 and 45 therefore we need mm. to know your age and then what actors but it's like you could be a young looking 50 year old exactly or an old looking 35 year old exactly yeah. so it's not actually part of the job to be that age yeah. it's part you just of have to credibly us. look that age so we I mean because we've yeah. batted this around in this union a fair bit about whether or not we want to go down the American path of saying you cannot ask for an age go mm. on what they look like yeah. Can we do that? Uh, well, you can do whatever you like. Um, <laughs> but but if they ask you your age, so let's say you've got that situation, you know, the, the part is 40 to 45, you're 35 as an actor, they are asking you your age to discriminate against you. So that could potentially be a discriminatory question. Um, if they actually do discriminate against you, they would have to go to a defence which would probably be the genuine operational requirements defence and your their argument would be, well, but the, pet, the part is for a 40 to 45 year old and it's like, well, no, the character is 40 to 45. As long as whoever's playing the character could credibly for, be 40 to 45, surely it doesn't matter what their actual age is. So I think there'd be a couple of ways you could kind of tackle that one. There has to be an individual complainant, is that right? Uh, no, and I'm about to get to that. If, um, once we get past the age, um, so, yeah, so like I was saying, most of the complaints we get are employment in, in age discrimination, unfortunately. And weirdly, we still don't have any court decisions. Like, no matters have actually gone to court mm -hmm. on age discrimination, so. Um, so the complaint process so we have a national information service which i would strongly urge anybody to use like our service is actually staffed by the people who actually handle the complaints so we've got like two complaint information officers and then everybody else kind of rotates on the service quite good because keeps us on our toes we get some very odd questions <laughs> um, you can contact us if you're a, com a potential complainant or respondent or you're just curious um, so if for example you as the union are implementing a new policy or a new membership requirement or whatever and you have questions you can call us as a potential respondent um, but if you, you can obviously also call us as organisers if you've got a particular case and you're kind of deliberating whether to make a complaint or even just to make the discrimination argument to the employer. So sometimes we get people who just want to know, like, could this be sexual harassment? Could this be disability discrimination? And sometimes all we're doing is kind of referring them to the right resources that they can use to talk to their employer about it. Yeah. Um, which then also brings you under the protection of those victimisation provisions <coughs> because if you're directly asserting your rights under the Act and then you get whacked over the head for it, you've then got a victimisation complaint potentially as well as a discrimination complaint. So, um, 
So absolutely call us. We're open between 10 and 4, but you can also write to us. Um, and as I was saying before, we get about 17,000 inquiries a year. Our website's also got some pretty good resources on it. So it's kind of worth um, a visit. Now this will address some of the questions I think you had over there. So what a complaint must say, <coughs> it must be on behalf of an aggrieved person or groups or group of people. So you can lodge group complaints. Um, you can lodge representative complaints as well. And we do sometimes get class complaints. Just be aware that if you're lodging on behalf of a class, so if you were lodging, for example, on behalf of all actors in Australia, um, what you need to be a bit conscious of is obviously you have to be able to demonstrate standing, but also you're preventing any individual in that class from lodging their own complaint about the same issue. So just be a bit conscious of that. You can also lodge on behalf of a whole bunch of individuals. So you could have a group of people in a particular workplace, for example, lodge about the same thing. And they can lodge that um, together or separately um, and tell us so like I've had matters where people have lodged separately but worked together and we know they're working together so we handle it as a single kind of matter um, so we're pretty flexible in terms of sort of making it work for people so a complaint must um, oh, make sure I cover everything <laughs> Yeah, so they reasonably, so they recently changed our legislation to kind of be more specific about what a complaint must do. So now when I say in writing, the Act Interpretation Act actually makes that broader. So if, if you're talking about, you can do online, you can do a form, we can provide assistance for people in taking a statement if, for example, they have a disability or they're illiterate. Um, we can provide assistance for them to draft it. Sometimes people have cognitive or psychosocial disabilities that make it difficult for them to gather their thoughts or put something together and we can help them with that. Um, and, and yeah, and as I was talking about, the person has to be aggrieved. Um, in terms of the Human Rights and ILO jurisdiction, it's a little, it's pretty similar but slightly less kind of onerous than the unlawful because that's the one the government was kind of targeting to try and make things uh, fairer for respondents. Um, so with the unlawful, you have to kind of demonstrate that what you're alleging could constitute dis discrimination, whereas in the other ones, it's a bit broader. So just so we're clear, an aggrieved person has to be somebody with more than kind of a passing connection. So sometimes we get people inquiring because they might say, you know, I live in Marrickville, there's a state election going on, I've just got some really racist propaganda against a particular um, a candidate or a particular group in the community. The first thing we will ask is, are you? of that particular group because if you're not aggrieved you can't have a claim um, so if you're just somebody who's generally concerned and offended you you don't necessarily have standing to make a complaint in terms of who can be a respondent pretty much anybody can be a respondent <laughs> um, so you can have individuals in for some things you can have organizations government non-government um, any size. So in the case of employment, for example, it's, we're not as constrained as Fair Work Act. So you don't have to be permanent. You don't have to be beyond your probation. Um, you don't have to be um, full-time or part-time or whatever. It can be any, um, any kind of employment relationship. So pretty broad. So how we actually deal with it. So the first thing that we'll do is that the director will assess whether, well, obviously whether we can accept it in the first place. And then probably the best thing to do in response to the complaint. So kind of going back to the, do we investigate without the respondent knowing, the act actually says that once we start investigating, we have to notify the respondent as soon as possible. 
actually the access immediately, but that's kind of impractical. Um, <laughs> so now what sometimes people do, and this is what we'll tell them on the info line, is you can kind of approach lodging a complaint in different ways. So if I get a call, for example, from a woman in a workplace who's saying, look, I think I've been sexually harassed, we talk about it, certainly sounds like it could constitute sexual harassment. She's kind of going, look, I'm still trying to go through the internal process or I've had a chat to him. It seems to have kind of eased off, but I'm a bit worried. Um, we might say, well, OK, you know, you know your rights now. Here's where all the information is. You know, keep it up your sleeve. Um, but they might say, look, I do want to lodge a complaint, but I'm scared of getting sacked. You know, and the fact is, like, the victimization provision is there, but we can't stop it from happening in the first place. So, that's a real consideration for people in ongoing relationships. This is where it's important to remember the time constraints, which somebody else was asking about. So, theoretically, now this is a discretionary ground. So, it it's not we're not as tied to it as for example the states are so the states can't accept a complaint that's beyond their time frame we can accept it but we might terminate it so if there's legitimate reasons why somebody didn't lodge at the time we will take those into consideration but essentially for um, unlawful discrimination it's six months and for um, human rights uh, breaches and the ILO grounds, it's 12 months. But that's, if you're talking about a sequence of events, it will be the last event in the sequence. So if you've got somebody who's been experiencing sexual harassment for three years and has tried to sort of deal with it and then get sacked, you know, and you lodge three months later, we can investigate the whole lot. Yeah. Um, and the court has no limitation so the court's view in cases that have gone up before it has been it's we don't care at, at most they might say that the statute for civil action which is usually anywhere between five and eight years depending on which state you're in um, might apply but otherwise they're they're pretty cool with it so um, so you know we don't just automatically kind of get rid of complaints just because they're six months old or whatever and because sometimes people like they might have been really unwell they might um, they might not have known about their rights you know they might only come to you six months later so um, just be a bit careful I guess in your jurisdiction there's been some pretty um, unfortunate cases where people have gone to us and fair work um, we used to think that the issue would only arise if they went to us and then Fair Work because Fair Work Act has got those kick out provisions if saying that basically you can't go to two agencies about a termination. So it's only where termination is involved. Um, but there's been some cases now where they apply it the other way. So somebody's gone to us and then Fair Work. Sorry. Someone's gone to fair work and then us, and the court said that we had no jurisdiction because the person went to fair work first. Mm -hmm. um, so they're basically saying that the Fair Work Act kind of works in conjunction with our act um, with respect to those kick out provisions. So just be a little bit careful about lodging in multiple jurisdictions at the same time because they're starting to tighten a lot of those um, kick out provisions. But you know, just give us a call if um, if you're unsure. Um, so basically, essentially, what would happen is that we we get the complaint, we assess the complaint, we try to decide what the best course of action is. Now, with unlawful discrimination, we now are obligated by the law to consider whether there's a reason to terminate it. So, if it appears to be lacking in substance or something else, we can do that up front. Um, that's pretty rare that that will happen because usually we'll need to do investigation to work out what the situation is. Um, we then, the first thing we would do is actually contact the um, complainant or the complainant's rep. So if you're acting on behalf of someone, we would call you. 
um, and kind of have a bit of a suss out about, look, what's happening? What's the current situation? Where do you want to go with this? Because in some cases, I mean, if you're talking, for example, about I'm a pregnant woman, I've gone on mat leave, I'm trying to get back to work and they're not giving me part-time work or they're saying I have to come back in two weeks otherwise I'll be terminated. We're not going to go through a lengthy investigation <laughs> um, and then try to conciliate it. We're probably going to put it to the parties that it might be a good idea to try and sort it out <laughs> before the, pers the employment relationship ends, right? So, um, and in cases like sexual harassment where it's very unlikely that we'll be able to make a call, I mean, if a respondent feels strongly that they want to respond, we'll let them do that. But we're not going to force them because ultimately we can't make a credibility call. If one person says it happened and the other person said it didn't, it, you know, we're not going to say I believe you and not her. Like it's um, so we tend to kind of in some cases go straight to a conciliation process. Now going back, sorry, to what I was saying about the employee who's kind of deciding whether to lodge now or lodge later. What we sometimes say to people is, look, you've got multiple choices. You can kind of lodge with us. Um, and make sure that you say on the complaint, you know, please contact me before actioning because I'm trying to sort this out locally and if I manage to sort it out, I don't want my employer to know. Um, so that's totally fine. We're quite happy to be used as kind of a bit of a safety blanket and because it can take a few weeks to allocate a matter, people might want to put that in the pipeline so that if things go pear-shaped, they can continue with the complaint process, but they might not necessarily want to let their employer know. Um, other people might tell their employer, look, I'm intending to lodge a complaint, but if we sort this out, I won't. Or they might say, I've already lodged a complaint, but I'll withdraw it if the matter gets sorted out locally. And we're quite happy for you to use us as leverage. We have no problem with that whatsoever. <laughs> So, so that's totally fine. It will really depend on the person's particular circumstances and what they feel comfortable with their employer knowing. Sometimes the benefit, particularly if you're dealing with a large corporate, um, so like a TV broadcaster, for example, is we go straight to the CEO. And unless we've got particular communication protocols, in which case we would go to their legal section, rather than going, say, you know, working up the ladder of management. So very often lodging a complaint can be a good way to kind of short circuit kind of the management rigmarole and bureaucracy because we go straight to the top. They might then allocate it further down, that's fine, but it kind of sort of means other people become aware of the issue rather than kind of the little bubble that the person's working in. If that makes sense. Um, if a respondent really wants to provide a response, we give them an opportunity to do that. Sometimes advocates like yourselves want a response because you've only got your person's account and you want to know what the employer's going to say. So totally fine if you lodge a complaint and we're kind of flagging that we might, you know, be saying, hey, do you want to go straight to a conciliation process? Totally okay for you to say, hey, look, I would actually really like a response because I want to know what I'm walking into and I'm going to be in a better position to advise um, my member if, if I know what the employer is going to say. So we're quite happy to work with the parties around some of those issues. Um, what is conciliation? So basically... It can happen in any number. We do travel around Australia to do it. It can happen face to face or by phone or sometimes in a shuttle process. So there are some matters where it's just not appropriate to bring the parties together. Um, if we're doing a conference, people can be represented as long as we consent for that to happen. We can provide adjustments around how the process runs. But it's generally a bit like a mediation that you might be used to in other jurisdictions we're not like fair work unfair dismissal so our conferences go for about four hours um, and there's a bit more kind of um, I guess because unfair dismissal is relatively straightforward they can be quite advisory we're much more letting the parties nut it out and argue it out as opposed to kind of having this very boom 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 kind of process um, in terms of outcomes, look, it's pretty broad. You can pretty much 
get as creative as you like. Um, we find that about where we attempt conciliation, about 76% of matters get resolved. We don't attempt conciliation in every matter. Um, and where matters do resolve, about 34% of them will have systemic outcomes. So they'd be things like changes in policy, changes in practice, um, staff training around discrimination or sexual harassment, any number of sort of things like that. Can I ask, how do you, how do you measure that or how do you know that? Is there follow-up work beyond the consideration? Um, because usually if there's an agreement, there'll be a signed agreement between the parties. Um, so we don't enforce agreements, so we don't do follow-up. Although we did do okay. some research a little while back, um, quite a few years back now, but um, where we actually followed up every respondent in a matter whether it was terminated or conciliated. And we actually found that a majority of them did implement policies anyway. Okay. So we actually find that sometimes just by lodging a complaint, a respondent kind of becomes a bit more aware of the issue. And yeah. if for no other reason than they want to avoid future complaints, <laughs> they... Yeah. They might um, implement policies even if the complaint can't be resolved. Fair enough. Thanks. Um, if a matter gets terminated, as I was saying, you do have the option of going to court. It is a cost jurisdiction, so that's kind of the big um, discourage of for some complainants because you are taking a big risk. So if you lose, you might have to pay the other party's costs as well as your own. The benefit, of course, is that it also works the other way around. Um, so um, you're not having to use whatever money you get awarded to pay your legal costs. Um, and it's not limited in terms of what a court can award. So the federal court rules are pretty broad. Realistically, it does tend to be financial compensation um, in various guises. So they can compensate for financial loss, for hurt and suffering, for... Um, you know any other kind of detriment they usually award a nominal amount just for being discriminated against etc um, and finally obviously if you want any more information you can give our National Information Service a call or you can go on our website and there's tons of information there um, oddly and this wasn't our choice there's an employers page which has a lot of our um, employment related resources which I think are just as useful for employees and unions as, as employers so things like our pregnancy guidelines and um, stuff like that but you can usually find all that stuff sort of around the website in different places as well but if you're having any problems you know finding anything or um, or you've got a question about a particular matter just call the National Information Service I mean I'm happy for my number to be circulated to you guys if you're probably not my mobile but my um <laughs> my office number um and feel free to give me a call that's totally fine if you're just trying to brainstorm um a matter so that's it guys excellent Ooh, Thank you. <laughs> were there any questions about anything um i have a question is there any data on around how much matters at all for the ones that have monetary outcomes and conciliation? Um, none that we publish. <laughs> but we do have uh, online, we have a conciliation register. Um, and so what we do is that we take, um, when a matter is resolved, if it appears appropriate to do so, so, you know, if, if it, it's not overly easily identifiable, that sort of thing, um, we um, de-identify the case, so we take out any personal information about the parties, etc. And we just have, so basically a paragraph about the complaint, a paragraph about the response, and then how it was resolved. So, you know, it might be, you know, um, uh, complainant was a, um, a secretary at the Respondent News Corporation or whatever, news agent. Um, agency she alleged that her manager sexually harassed her including by blah 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 examples um, she felt she had no option but to resign or she says she made an internal complaint and then she was constructively dismissed whatever it happens to be then there may or may not be a response because sometimes they just say oh let's just go straight to conference 
Um, and then it will just say the complaint was resolved with an agreement that the company pay her X amount of money, provide her with an apology and deliver training to the alleged manager, whatever it happens to be the sort of outcome. So that's often quite a good resource if you're just trying to get a sense of, and you can search by, um, you know, ground or by keywords. So sexual harassment, employment, for example, and you'll get those cases. So, and we sort of put a few up every year. So we tend to sort of um, wait about a year before we put any cases up. And that's just so that people aren't looking at that case going, that's me, that's me, you know, like <laughs> putting a bit of distance. Um, but yeah, and we don't put absolutely every case up because some of them, I mean, as you would have probably viewed in your own work, like you've got sort of um, other circumstances involved. So you might have a number of disputes on foot, you might, and possibly hours kind of resolves everything. And so you might have an inordinate, for example, amount of money but that's because there's an end to the employment relationship or a redundancy package or something like that, you know, that isn't just about the complaint. So we don't always put every single matter up and other matters are just too obvious to, um, to kind of put up because they'd be too easily identifiable and we'd be breaching those people's privacy. So, um, yeah, but that's quite a useful. So that's on the complaints page of our website. It's, there's a little tab which is conciliation register and you can just look stuff up there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Anything so, else? Um, usually like our monetary compensation to most discrimination cases. In employment, it's pretty common yeah. um, because you've usually got lots of income. <laughs> so, yeah. so the person usually wants some compensation. Um, not necessarily overall, but yeah, it is pretty common. I would say in most employment matters there'd be um, compensation awarded and ver um, uh, sorry compensation agreed to mm. and because sometimes the reality is that the employment relationship is no longer sustainable so yeah. sometimes what we're negotiating is an end to the employment relationship and on what basis that person is going to leave so we sometimes get complaints where you know, whether the original starting point was alleged sexual harassment or whatever, the person's now been on stress leave or whatever for six months um, and really the chances of them going back to work are pretty unlikely and possibly not good for the person. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes what we're negotiating is an end to that relationship. So. Um, in those cases, you would almost always have financial compensation, yeah. But not always, so we do get some that just settle for sort of systemic -y type outcomes or... And I mean, some of them are quite, you know, so some of the complaints we get um, might be things like, you know, I tried to go to my local restaurant and they wouldn't let me in because I have a, a guide dog, you know. Mm -hmm. So we're just calling the restaurant and going, hey, do you understand what a guide dog is and blah 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 and they just say oh yeah she can come back anytime and we'll put a guide dogs welcome sticker on the window and that sometimes can be enough to resolve yeah. a matter so it's pretty broad you can get pretty creative yeah yeah uh, so I have a <coughs> sorry I have a question so uh, the general protections part of the Fair Work Act pretty much lists all the legislation that you've gone through today. Yeah. Um, and that can include cases that may or may not involve a dismissal. Mm. Um, so what sort of benefits would we have in, say, opting for the Human Rights Commission as a... Oh, that's a tricky. Are versus... you asking me to diss the Fair Work Commission? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think... Um, I mean, it's difficult for me to say, and I'm not an expert on the Fair Work Act. There was just something recently... Um, I think there's some concern that the Fair Work Commission is interpreting some of the grounds very conservatively. Um, so I have been told by some employment law practitioners that I think the interpretation of disability in the Fair Work Act is more limited than the one in um, the Disability Discrimination Act or the state laws. Um, but also I think the what appears to be happening is that sometimes when considering Fair Work matters, either the Commission or the Federal Court are taking a very conservative approach that almost... So, you know, they're citing things like Purvis, which was like a 2000 case, 
which has since which has had seen like two amendments to the DDA since then, one or two, um, and subsequent case law that is being completely ignored. Mm. So, um, so there are some who say like if you've got a complex <coughs> discrimination matter, you might be better off going the sort of anti-discrimination route, whether that be state or federal. Um, Whereas if you've got a fairly straightforward matter, then obviously Fair Work has got the advantage that it is quicker. It tends to be a quicker mm. process. Um, and for, I mean, some have said that Fair Work um, can be difficult if you're not represented. Mm. Um, I guess in our process, we do a lot of work around power imbalances. So we do, for example, refer some vulnerable, we have warm referral relationships with a number of practitioners and we do refer people if we think they're particularly vulnerable for example um, so I guess there's a whole range of factors you might consider um, definitely fair work is faster so that's um, one issue my understanding is that the awards under discrimination tend to be higher because we have no limit um, and my understanding just from anecdotal input is that our conciliation financial settlements are higher. But that's anecdotal only because Fair Work Commission doesn't release that information. So um, they take a, a more conservative approach to confidentiality than we do. And can I ask what the difference is between when you choose whether you lodge with the State Discrimination Board or with the Yeah, Rights so again, I'm not going to diss the ADB. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, there I think the processes are a bit more similar. So I think we tend to kind of adopt different, appro similar approaches to complaints. So sometimes it can be technicalities. So there are, so for example, I think the Anti-Discrimination Act doesn't cover private schools in the case mm. of education, so you would automatically come to us. Um, there are grounds that we have that state doesn't have, so gender identity is broader under us, we have intersex status. Um, but, you know, and there may be, and sometimes it could be a definitional issue, so the way discrimination is defined might be slightly different in a way that favours one or the other jurisdiction. One of the things that people tend to talk about is that if you go to a state jurisdiction and then end up in a tribunal, um, you the tribunals are not a cost jurisdiction. So if you lose, there's less risk um, financially unless the, the tribunal considers that you've been uncooperative or whatever, in which case they might award costs. But generally speaking, there's no costs awarded. Of course, the downside is that any costs you incur come out of whatever award you get. So that's, I guess, the double-edged sword of the costs issue. Um, Whereas, of course, if you're going federal, it's a federal court. So it's a, yeah. a different type of process. So, look, I don't know. Again, I've had different feedback from different representatives as to why they choose one or the other. Be careful, again, because we both kind of have limitations if you've lodged. So, for example, in our case, if you've lodged with the Anti-Discrimination Board, unless um, they have no jurisdiction, we literally can't touch it. So if they, if they, if you sort of go through their service and you're not happy with it and you withdraw, for example, you still can't lodge with us. Mm. So, um, so just be very careful before you lodge to, to make sure that you're kind of working out which jurisdiction you want to go with. Okay. Um, so I know, for example, a lot of CLCs tend to go state because they want to create precedent. So they're often wanting to take matters mm. to decision level and of course it's safer to do that through a tribunal whereas I know that other reps particularly if they're not intending to take the matter to court if they're just wanting to get a settled outcome might come to us but it might fluctuate too because maybe agencies are sometimes better sometimes not <laughs> so um, yeah any number of factors 
what's the, is, can you give us like an average of how long it might take between lodging a complaint and reaching conciliation? It agreement? really varies. So our um, average last year, I think, was four and a bit months. So that was from lodgement to closure. Yeah. Um, some can take significant, so I mean, my oldest matter has probably been going for about 18 months, but that's an extremely complicated matter where we've had to defer a number of times. So there was a criminal investigation, so we had to defer for that, then we had to defer for, um, because we wanted to get her an advocate. Um, you know, so there's been a range of sort of issues that's made it go quite long. We've had other matters that we kind of settle on the day we receive it because they're really straightforward and yeah. we can just make a call and go, hey, <laughs> what's going on? Um, so it really, really varies. Yeah. Just just so we have as complete a picture as, as, as we can in um, giving advice to members. Um, mm. If... So um, you have 60 days to lodge from the end of the conciliation process in the federal court? Not from the end of a conciliation process, from closure. From closure, okay. Yeah, so if we are terminating a matter, yeah. um, you have 60 days from the termination notice okay. to lodge in the federal court. And is, is what they can investigate is like the fact finding completely limited by um, the investigation that you guys have undertaken? Not or? the investigation, the subject matter of the complaint. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. which does sometimes mean that by, like it's quite interesting sometimes when you read decisions of matters that you've handled because you're like, they're framing this completely differently to what they did when they were before us. So, um, and that might just be because you're going through a much deeper process of fact finding and things like that. Whereas often at our process, I mean, you know, the whole point of our process is supposed to be that it's a bit of a buffer. So people aren't necessarily, you know, a lot of people aren't represented. A lot of people haven't had advice. Um, so as long as the subject matter is the same and you can amend complaints as you go. So if, um, so we get all sorts of situations. So it might be, for example, that when you lodge, you're still employed, but then you get terminated after you've lodged. And so you might amend to add the termination as part of your complaint. Or then what I've had happen sometimes is we have a complaint, we go through it, um, and then the person lodges the first claim in court and then lodges a second complaint to cover the intervening period, say. So I had, um, there was a recent matter, Watts um, versus Australia Post, not that recent, it was a couple of years ago. But um, really good decision on reasonable adjustment, if that's something you're kind of, and she was an ongoing employee, so good on her. But, um, but yeah, but she, so she'd lodged a complaint, it had gone to conciliation, it was terminated, she lodged in the federal court, and then because the alleged discrimination was still happening, she lodged a second complaint about the next kind of six months, um, so that she could join them at the federal court and the court could consider the whole time um, period. So um, the court then considered those two together. So yeah, so you can, it's pretty flexible kind of in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, and if you do kind of, so even things like respondents, so it's not uncommon to have to add or remove respondents throughout the process because you might incorrectly name a respondent, you know, particularly these days where you've got like labor hire and different companies broken up into different parts and all of that sort of stuff, it can get quite difficult to, know exactly who the employer is or which company made a particular decision or whatever the situation happens to be. So you can kind of um, amend as you go um, to add or remove respondents. And you could have a situation where if you have multiple respondents to a complaint, you can decide which ones you want to go to court against. So you don't have to go to court against all of them. And we do have situations where a matter might resolve against one respondent and not the others. So, yeah, so it's, again, it's a pretty flexible process in that sense. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much. That's all right. Incredibly useful.